nice save. <laughs> Perfect order. When we see it, we know that it's fragile, and we wonder how it came to be. Was it luck? These are Bali's new UNESCO World Heritage. About a year and a half ago, UNESCO recognized the rice terraces on the Indonesian island of Bali as a world heritage with outstanding universal value. So there's an inscription from the ninth century by a Balinese king who refers to irrigation tunnel builders. And we know that terraces like this have been in existence for over a thousand years. But if you look closely at them, notice a few things. First of all, they look almost like a jewel. There's this faceted shape to them. Notice also that they're very extensive. So there are thousands of people who are involved in maintaining that system, maintaining that jewel-like shape. And yet, they're made out of earth and mud, and they'll fall apart. They'll turn into a muddy hillside in the space of a week or two, unless hundreds and thousands of people manage to maintain it in that faceted, beveled shape. So what do we make of a system like that? Well, at the moment, the rice terraces of Bali are disappearing at a rate of about 1,000 hectares each year. That rate is accelerating, and the Balinese would like a word. In 1975-76, the Green Revolution had just begun. The Green Revolution means the introduction of Western farming techniques, basically. It's high-yielding plants that are designed to grow quickly, along with chemical fertilizers and pesticides. So this came as a package to the Balinese farmers. The farmers were told, in the interests of national development, take this new rice and plant just as fast as you can. If you can get three crops a year, great. Some of the old people said, well, the trouble with that is, according to our traditional system, we, we schedule, you know, we carefully time when the water goes into the fields and when it doesn't. And it has their reasons for that. After a couple of years of bumper harvest, those reasons started to become clear. Stephen Lansing's old friend, Wayan Pege, is a farmer in Sebatu. He remembers what it was like 20 years ago when the pests began to appear. The Green Revolution remedy for pests was pesticides. It's not just that the farmers were advised to use pesticides. They were forced to use pesticides. They would, they would be punished by the government if they didn't, because the government would say, if anybody doesn't use pesticides immediately, as soon as any sign of pests appear, then the pest will spread to other fields. So within a year or two, even the farmers you know, pumping these pesticides into their fields couldn't kill all the pests. The government then began to fly the island dropping pesticides from airplanes, and they succeeded in killing damn near everything. He says that everything is made by a creator, and so uh, by disturbing anything, by killing anything, you're, you're disturbing part of the creation, so you need to pay attention to the whole picture. Essentially, he's saying you have to pay attention to the whole picture. Wow. Yeah. And that, Stephen told me, was the role of the water temple. Looking at the whole picture, applying wisdom accumulated over centuries. In the middle courtyard of the temple, the farmers gather every month. They make decisions in a democratic assembly on how they're going to plant. So this is how it works. Here's our village and our water temple, and there's the water coming downstream from the weir, but we share that water with the other guys in B here, in village number B, and then just up there is C. C sets its own irrigation schedule. They decide when they will plant and harvest, and then we coordinate with them. So the water is allocated from one group to the next, to achieve two goals, 
to divide it so that enough water is present in everybody's fields, but also to create a synchronized fallow period when after harvest the fields can be flooded and there's nothing left for the pests to eat. And that way it's possible to control the pests. So the Subaks, which are the Balinese traditional system for managing this system, the ones who meet in the water temples, they capture irrigation water from the rivers and springs. If we could advance the slide one, right, so there we are with um, irrigation canal coming out of the mountains because the rivers fall in Bali along the steep volcanic hillsides and they pick up little quantities of pumice as the rivers, you know, during the monsoon flow over that steep landscape and therefore they, they exist deep in channels in the ravines. So the Balinese farmers for over a thousand years have been digging irrigation canals like that one in order to make it possible to get the water to the summit of a hillside downstream, next slide, which they can then terrace, and that becomes a perpetual source of food for their you know, generations to come. So, all right, so water is used to control the pests. Lots of things like to eat rice besides people, like insects and rats and bacterial and viral diseases. But by synchronizing the harvest, they can remove the habitat for the pests. So if you look at that picture, they've just harvested, they've flooded the fields, there's nothing left for the pests to eat. But to accomplish that, it means a lot of farmers had to plant at exactly the same time. It has to be tightly, tightly synchronized. So, okay, it's an easy solution, except that there are dozens and dozens of these subox, these community-sized irrigation systems, along a typical river in Bali. So how do they get it right? You know, because how much water we take out influences how much our neighbors get, get downstream. How do they get it right? Okay, here's a simulation model. <laughs> Those little squares are the Subak. So there are 172 of them in that picture along two rivers, the Os and the Patanu in central Bali. And we simply simulated the flow of water. So here we are. The question is, how do all those little subaks manage to get enough water to each group so they can grow their rice and also control the pests? So we create a simulation model in which the rains fall and the rivers flow and the rice grows and the pests move around and they eat the rice and at the end of the year, you get a harvest, okay? So we simulate that for a year, random selection of cropping patterns. And then at the end of the year, each of the subaks checks to see how well they did, you know, how much rice did we grow, compared to our four closest neighbors. If the neighbor did better, copy what they did. Otherwise, if I did better, I stick to what I did before. Okay, so what happens? Well, here's what happens. After the first year, we have a random cropping schedule. The computer randomly distributed irrigation schedules on all those subox. So not surprisingly, there are water shortages and the pests move around and the harvest yield isn't very good. But then they're going to organize themselves because they're going to check with their neighbors, copy the best neighbor, and within 10 years, synchronized harvests appear over blocks. And you can probably see that. Blocks of little symbols, they're doing the same thing. That manages to control both the pests in the water, and it nearly doubles the rice yield by a simple process of trial and error in the villages. The last picture are the actual water temple patterns, the real water temple patterns of the Os and the Patanu, and you'll notice that they are nearly identical. In other words, we can grow a water temple network in the computer very easily. In fact, if we give the, uh, excuse me, if we give biologically plausible values for the pests in the water and the rice, we'll always grow water temple networks. They will emerge from this process, this trade-off of humans interacting with, with nature. Okay, so that's great, but remember the Green Revolution? The Green Revolution was about setting aside that traditional pattern of water temple organization so that everybody could plant as fast as possible and grow as much rice as possible. Well, we can duplicate the effects of that by running our simulation in reverse. Okay? If we run it backwards so that everybody's doing their own thing at a different time, what happens is we achieve chaos in the irrigation systems and pest explosions. Those are the words used by the Asian Development Bank. As they studied what had happened, they'd created havoc. They created chaos by misunderstanding, by simply not noticing the role of the temples, this simple ancient system of control by trial and error through the water temple networks. Okay, so happily, 
Once the final evaluation had been done by the Asian Development Bank, they said, oh my goodness, we goofed, <laughs> right? And actually the traditional system is better than anything anybody else has devised. The simple system of control that you can re replicate in your computer very easily. So, question, is everything fine now? Well, not quite. And here's what's still missing from this picture. Once the government there we go, let's try that. This, they allowed the water temples to regain control. But the green revolution still lingers. To this day, farmers add chemical fertilizer to this ancient self-sustaining system. For the last 30 years, the farmers have been borrowing money from the village cooperatives to buy fertilizer that they don't need, applying it to the fields, it washes out of the fields immediately, flows back into the rivers and down to the sea. This little stream is flowing right out of those rice paddies up there. And as it comes down, it's of course carrying all the mineral nutrients from the volcanic soil, plus all that fertilizer. I mean, all the fertilizer that wasn't needed by the farms and is just washing down. So by the time it gets here, the sea, it's like a thin nutrient soup. And so the effect is you grow simple organisms like algae, the algae that you see growing along the rocks there. And that's what we find offshore, just blanketing the coral reefs. And we only find it in places like this where you've got that kind of agricultural drainage. On the rest of the island, if there's no river carrying fertilizer, then the reefs are fine. But out there, the reefs are nearly dead. Stephen Lansing and his colleagues are gathering samples from reefs around Bali, trying to understand the complex web we humans are part of. I think the, the point to notice about this is, so the people who brought the Green Revolution to Indonesia and to Bali had the best of motives. They were very good scientists, and the idea was to increase Indonesia's rice yields. The problem is the subtlety of the system it was simply invisible. They didn't notice the water temple system. So we have these continuing effects where the nitrogen is now, you know, the algae grown on farmers' fertilizer, excess fertilizer, is now killing the reefs around the islands. So to me, the moral to the story is we need, we need to be a little smarter. We need to pay attention to these emergent processes. So in this case, we've got the excess fertilizer needlessly destroying the reefs around the agricultural drainages. And then more generally, that the functional role of the water temple networks was simply not noticed. They look like a religious system. They look like a religious system, so their ecological role was not, you know, never came into view. Now that we know something about nonlinear processes, we have a theory about how these things come into existence. What we're seeing here, what I've just given you, is a, is a now famous example of emergent complexity. How what appears to be a random process of chance has a tendency to move towards order. This is a, this is a real world example of emergent order as a complex adaptive system. But it raises the question, you know, what else are we missing? Where else in the world where human beings are interacting with nature might we find things like the Balinese water temple system, which nearly disappeared. I mean, it could have vanished. It could have simply disappeared during the Green Revolution without anyone noticing that it was gone. So we'll think about that for a moment. Balinese have been trying to bring the world's attention to their water temple networks for you know, since the Green Revolution times, in 2009, they flew an island. I mean, they flew an island. They flew an airplane full of Balinese farmers and officials, all kinds of people, to Paris, to UNESCO, to request for the fourth time uh, world heritage status for their water temples and their rice terraces. Like the previous four attempts, it failed. UNESCO watched the performance of a Subak ritual in their headquarters in Paris, and they thought it was delightful and charming, and they had no idea what to do with it, right? <laughs> but last year, 2012, UNESCO said yes. However, they also warned that it, it's almost too late. Bali is in danger of being loved to death by the world, people coming to see these things like their ice terraces. So the goal of the world heritage now is to bring this ecological role of the water temples 
into view, to make it visible, not only for its own sake, because we hope that it may be possible to, to, to you know, with the two and a half million tourists a year who come through Bali, if once they walk through it and understand what this complex adaptive system of rice terraces is about, how that functions, perhaps they'll begin to wonder for themselves, is there something like this elsewhere in my world? What else are we missing? Where else are these kinds of processes going on that we would just not quite recognize, not quite see? Finally, the Balinese want to emphasize, yes, the water, I, I'm an ecologist by training, so I push very hard on the ecological function of the water temple networks. And when I do, my Balinese colleagues often correct me and they say, UNESCO recognized Tri Hitakarana. It means the interrelationship of spirit and humans and nature. And that's really what the water temple system is all about. Thanks very much.